Okay, great. Uh, can you hear as well, uh, Javier? Perfect. Perfect. So uh, I will formally introduce Javier Gomez Prieto, who is a policy officer at ANISA. And uh, this panel will be organized in two parts. So first, uh, Javier will give us, uh, provide a keynote on uh, European Cybersecurity Skills Framework. Uh, and then we, we have four panelists. We will come on the stage and we'll continue, continue the discussion, including Javier in the panel. So uh, I warmly welcome you, Javier. Uh, uh, it's great that you are at least available online with us, so everyone is here and looking at you. So stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the invitation to all Concordia project uh, partners. Uh, it's great to see actually people meeting together. Uh, fortunately for me, it was not possible to be there. Um, but okay, with the same spirit, I, I, I come here to uh, share with you uh, the results actually of the last two years uh, working on this uh, European Cybersecurity Skills uh, Framework. So my name is Javier Gomez. I work at the NISA Policy Development and Implementation Unit, and I also work in uh, the, the, the work related to awareness raising and, and education of uh, cybersecurity aspects. So if uh, I can ask uh, the colleague uh, to take the next slide, please. So basically what I'm going to uh, share with you today is uh, these three, four aspects. The first one is a general overview of the cybersecurity skills framework. Then I will uh, um, present some, some of the profiles. We have identified 12 profiles of cybersecurity uh, sector. Then I will illustrate some benefits of the framework. And finally, uh, some specific examples of the application of, of the framework. Next, please. So to start with this cybersecurity, uh, the, the European Cybersecurity Skills Framework, uh, next. I will, I will start by the, could you please go to the next? Basically to say this, this slide illustrates uh, one of the main aspects driving actually uh, our work in the last two years. And basically, in one hand, there is a prominent shortage uh, element of cybersecurity skills in, in Europe, accompanied with um, lack of skilled workforce uh, in, for, for conducting cybersecurity tasks uh, in, in several sectors. So these two elements are very important. As the cybersecurity, you know, is, is a very evolving uh, domain. Uh, requiring uh, continuously a lot of people to work on that uh, with difficulties. So uh, for that reason, Enisa embarked in this um, initiative of uh, contributing actually to provide a common framework for uh, helping to identify specific profiles and to, to share a specific knowledge among member states and, and people working in cybersecurity skills. Next, please. So with that, with that spirit, actually, the, the cybers, the ECF, CSF uh, objectives are basically to create a common understanding of the roles, uh, the competence and skills and knowledge, uh, facilitate cybersecurity skills recognition by bringing uh, uh, together people working on, on that domain and putting, putting uh, that knowledge in common and support also the design of cybersecurity related training programs. So these are driving elements of the, of the cybersecurity framework. Um, we had uh, this year the, the, the first cybersecurity skills conference in Athens, in which uh, we, we, we presented actually these two outcomes in detail. I will present some parts of those uh, uh, today. But basically, there are two uh, reports here. So the first one is the the profiles, uh, the role profiles document in which uh, we identify 12 uh, profiles. Later on, I will explain uh, specificities of, of those. And then there is a user manual document uh, in which you may find uh, aspects related to, for example, the principles, 
uh, and yeah, get general guidance aspects for the application of the frame, framework. Uh, next, please. So in terms of principles, uh, we want it to be, uh, and I, I should highlight here the word common, uh, because of course, when talking about cybersecurity skills at EU level, uh, of course, for us was um, challenging, but at the same time, easy to come up uh, with some uh, pan-European approach. But we understand that uh, when it comes to application of um, the framework in a specific uh, context, territorial, socioeconomic, member states level, of course, the picture may be different. So for that reason, we wanted to go um, towards um, simplicity, for example, uh, and also to propose a framework in a flexible manner that could be adapted to the specific needs. Um, open, impartial, scalable. So we'll, these are principles that you can find in the, in the user manual. Next. And then I, will, I, I would uh, introduce you to to the profiles, could you go please to the next? These profiles, as I as I mentioned at the beginning, are twelve profiles. Here you have the general picture of those profiles. So um, you may be familiar with some of them. There may be others or specific parts of profiles that perhaps are not showcased here. But again, I insist in the word common uh, because the idea was to in a way, create a baseline of, of profiles that could eventually be scalable and, and adapted to specific needs. So we have, for example, cybersecurity architects, educators, researchers, CISO, cyber incident respondent, threat intelligence specialists, and so on. So, of course, these uh, profiles are uh, well detailed in the, in, the, in the framework. And then you can have details. Next, please. In the next slide, um, yeah, this is this is um, an example. I will not go to, of course, <laughs> all the twelve profiles. Otherwise, we will need to be here till tomorrow. Uh, but just this one to to illustrate you um, specificities of it. So, for example, this uh, CISO profile, uh, we identify the specific mission of managing uh, the organization's cybersecurity strategy and its implementation to ensure that digital systems, services, and assets are ad adequately secure and protected. Um, elements related to this profile uh, are framed within a cybersecurity strategy and policy. Some of the profiles, for example, CISO, entail some kind of managerial or executive role sometimes, whereas, uh, whereas other profiles uh, would be uh, placed more, let's say, on operative and technical aspects. Next, please. And here is an extract of the of the document, the report, uh, in which for each one of the profiles we have identified uh, these nine components: uh, the profile title, alternative titles, because in some cases um, the profile could be named differently, a summary statement, uh, basically, um, yeah. What is the main the main aspects identifying the, this uh, profile, the mission, or deliverables, or, or yeah, those areas in which uh, this profile, specific profile, is expected to to deliver uh, tasks, skills, uh, knowledge, and e competences uh, identified. So you have this information, these tables actually for for each one of the profiles. Next, please. And. Uh, Basically, um, some may think that this specific framework is for uh, one particular target audience, and in reality, we want to uh, contribute to the to different uh, works uh, carried out, for example, by organizations at the time of um, hiring uh, or wanting to hire or promote the skills in, in the organizations. Um, skilling, skilling, sorry, sorry for the learning providers uh, at the time, for example, at um, integrating new aspects of uh, of uh, profiles or combining profiles. Um, individuals uh, also because uh, they may see this framework as an um, inspiring element to, to drive their careers uh, path, their learning uh, paths as well. 
policy makers at the time of uh, yeah, what to do with these profiles and how to uh, support their development. And uh, yeah, communities of professionals and associations uh, related to certification processes and uh, things like that. Uh, so up to here, next please, I have um, showcased the framework in general. Now let's go to some uh, specific benefits we have identified of this framework. Uh, so in terms of um, organizations, uh, yeah, this is uh, this this is like illustrates some of them. So it, it may be useful to develop cybersecurity strategies, uh, organization structure and HR planning. Um, also to uh, improve recruitment offers based on, on, on a specific information of the profiles, identify and assess candidates, uh, um, perform cybersecurity roles, skills uh, gap analysis, uh, defining development and training plans and so on. Uh, next, please. We have also identified uh, specific benefits for learning providers, uh, as for example, at the time of designing uh, learning programs, uh, things happening uh, specifically within each one of the institutions, but also related to collaborations with other institutions. So uh, the idea is that, yeah, this framework contributes to establish that, that kind of uh, common dialogue between institutions to share, exchange, and learn from each other. Um, assessment and recognition processes of learning uh, learning paths uh, and career career orientation to, to students for example uh, professional level as well uh, the same work from an individual point of view uh, yeah as i was telling before uh, yeah the idea is that um, individuals can can look at this uh, document see what i what i what i see where i see myself uh, in the future is working, I don't know, as a penetrator tester or as a CISO. So I identify specific elements of um, the skills, the knowledge, the competences. And yeah, the idea is to contribute also to that, uh, to provide that information to individuals at the time of designing um, their, their career uh, and training goals. Uh, yeah, by, by illustrating cybersecurity work requirements uh, and, and paths. Next, please. And uh, also elements related to uh, policymakers and legal stakeholders. Uh, of course, there is an element of understanding uh, the cybersecurity field, even from, from public administration. Uh, sometimes there are uh, lack of understanding of, uh, let's say, the, 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 the whole component of, of profiles. So in, with that, uh, with that spirit, we aim at contributing to reduce those gaps, and providing elements also for for planning, cybersecurity capacity building activities, or mapping of uh, uh, yeah multiple cybersecurity initiatives uh, related to uh, supporting uh, yeah activity on cyber skills. Next, please. And now. Finally, this is the final part. Uh, I, I'm going to finish with three specific examples of applications of the framework. And um, next, so this this is um, the first one. So the the, the scenario is uh, very straightforward. Imagine that uh, owners of a cloud service company are actually using the the cybersecurity skills framework, and they have. Uh, uh, identified five roles uh, to support cyber security activity in the enterprise. Here we illustrate uh, one a CISO, one cyber security legal officers, one cyber security architect, one implementer, and I cannot see the other, and sorry, three, three implementer and uh, the other one. I don't see it because of the picture. So next please, next slide. And <clears throat> Basically, with this slide, we we want to illustrate that uh, there are there are several several outcomes out, out of this uh, usage of this uh, application of the framework. For example, the first three components uh, end in identifying actually training needs uh, based on the identification of these three profiles. Perhaps these three uh, profiles 
and may be available within the company. So what you just need to do is to train or to um, yeah to provide the skills uh, to to those people, and so that you have actually a strong component of the the competences required for for exercising the task. The second part is, is actually related to um, uh, needs at the time of recruiting personnel. So if uh, the company sees that uh, nobody is available or uh, there is a persistent lack of uh, skills in, in, in available personnel, perhaps they may want to opt for hiring an external person so that the framework can contribute, for example, to uh, create or uh, provide uh, elements to uh, actually create the, uh, the profile and the, the job description contributing to HR people. And then some elements related to external collaboration, which is the last one that, for example, could be a profile that in some occasions uh, there is no specific need to have that uh, in-house service, but you may just want to externalize that because of several reasons, economic practicity, uh, sensitiveness, whatever. So uh, yeah, you, you may want to uh, establish collaboration with uh, with external experts. And these are three specific uh, applications uh, of that. Next, please. So uh, I think this is the second, yeah, the second example. Here, the scenario is a, uh, an insurance company to say that uh, is expanding actually cyber security, uh, adding cyber security to the compliance department, and they have identified uh, the need to recruit a cyber compliance officer. So that uh, people in HR uh, uh, initiates a consultation process with people and managers in the company to identify specific needs. Next, please. And these are the tasks that actually have been identified uh, in that consultation. So, for example, these are uh, cyber compliance officer uh, needs to provide legal advice uh, on data privacy and protection, uh, identify document gaps, uh, develop audit plans, collect evidence and reporting, for example. OK, so next, please. And after that, um, Here's an interesting element of the application because actually uh, by using, by consulting the document, the cybersecurity skills framework, they realize that actually there are two profiles that could in a way or integrate a specific task of that identified profile. So uh, as I was mentioning in the in the principles uh, slide, there is uh, yeah no concern at the time of, of using, it's quite flexible. So users of the framework can actually pick up uh, pieces or components of profiles and you know, confectionate uh, a specific if a specific profiles according to the needs. So here is, is an example. Uh, next one. And uh, finally, as a, as a result, uh, by using the framework, the, there has been, uh, been this um, uh, elaboration of the profile on cyber compliance officer specifically according to the needs of the enterprise and HR could successfully draft the vacancy description. Uh, next one, this is the third example. This is uh, it's a little bit more focused on individuals at the time of um, yeah, analyzing, investigating what uh, what what I want should I do in the future if I want to embark in the cybersecurity sector or if I just want to scale up my skills? Um, so here we have two people, two colleagues um, looking uh, around about uh, these profiles. So the framework can be useful for that. Next, please. And uh, of course, the components I was describing in the each for, for the profiles. Uh, provide that information that should be in a way considered uh, from the workplace perspective in terms of mission deliverables and tasks. So elements related to what actually the organization does. And 
in a way for individuals as well, useful information on the skills, knowledge and competences that actually they may need for uh, yeah, being considered as a profile uh, to work on that cyber cybersecurity task. Next, please. And this uh, this analysis, this this kind of reflection actually leads to um, identify your milestones to configurate your your needs and, and accordingly to act. Uh, uh, by the way, in brackets now I, I say that uh, apart from the framework, we also have a registry. Uh, Enisa has developed a registry of. Uh, vocational education and, and training and, and educational institutions providing master's degrees for uh, cybersecurity. So uh, this is um, a register with, uh, I think, 600 entries now. And there is, uh, that, there is uh, for example, that possibility that one individual uh, analyzing what are their needs, then he also can use that registry at the time of uh, deciding what to study, how to study, which institution study, and finally to improve curriculum. Next one, please. And so that, uh, yeah, we come up with uh, several learning uh, programs according to the needs of the individuals, according to yeah, specific uh, expectations on to work on the cybersecurity uh, domain. And uh, yeah, we uh, with the framework we aim at uh, providing uh, or contributing to uh, to clarify actually to give light on, on those uh, those elements for people as well. So this is my final slide. I hope uh, is being clear. Of course, you have many information, detailed information in the in the documents. I would just want to conclude by saying that uh, this is this is. Uh, this has been an important task of ENISA. Uh, it's not a, an ending product, this is a process and this is just a part of the process because the framework is, let's say, the baseline for, for, for creating a common language. But of course, we will need to work with people in member states, with authorities, with stakeholders. We need to identify specific cases uh, to test actually the, uh, the framework. And, uh, we target actually a, a, a real implementation of the framework across member states in, in the future. So thanks for your time. And now I'm at your disposal in case you have questions. Thanks. Sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Javier. So we, uh, with this, we start the second part of our um, uh, panel or, or a cybersecurity slot. Uh, I would like to invite our three great panelists. Uh, all three are Concordians. Uh, Felicia from EIT Digital, uh, Iro from Trust IT, and Joachim from Masarch University. Welcome. <laughs> and Javier will stay with us uh, also online. I think we can sit here. So I guess before we start, uh, let's have a quick, you know, one, two minutes uh, formal introduction to ourselves so people know who we are and, uh, you know, what's your, why you are here today. So I start myself. My name is Shahid. Uh, I'm the director of cybersecurity unit at RISE, Research Institutes of Sweden. Uh, RISE is a state-owned company. We are 3,000 people working on different aspects. Uh, I'm also the founder of RISE Cyber Range, which is the largest cybersecurity test and demo arena in Stockholm. And also RISE is part of NCC, uh, National NCC, um, where we have the responsibility to uh, take care of the community building. Uh, and last but not least, which is very relevant for this panel, is uh, we are now starting something called Cyber Campus in Sweden. Uh, hopefully we'll get some time to discuss this. So I'm very much looking forward to this discussion and uh, indeed cybersecurity skills is the, I think one of the main gaps we have in, in Europe uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, you know, innovations and other things. So we need people. Uh, we start with Felicia. 
Yes, hello, I'm Felicia Kutas. Do I need to... Yeah, you need to hold on this. Uh, I'm Felicia Kutas uh, from EIT Digital, uh, based in Brussels, and uh, as part of Concordia, uh, I was leading the work on the education task, uh, doing some great work with uh, the colleagues here. Uh, I will enter in details a bit later. Thank you, Felicia. Jakob? Hi, I'm Jakub from Asarg University. I'm the, the person behind Kaipo CyberRange platform, which we, which we released in Concordia as the first CyberRange open source CyberRange in Europe, hopefully. I still think it's also in the world, but let's not be cocky. And yeah, in, in our task, we work on cyber ranges. We're working on exchanging the content between the cyber ranges. And from, from my work at Master University, I'm also behind cybersecurity exercises for like energy industry, banks, and so on. So a lot of cool stuff, I guess. Thank you, Jakob. And we go to Iro. OK, hello. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm Miro Hadzopoulou. I am a senior consultant with uh, TIFF Trust IT here in Germany. Uh, in Concordia, I'm leading the certification and standardization tasks. They're very, very exciting to all people, standardization certification tasks. And uh, hopefully we will give you some inputs here about certification also in the area of skills. Perfect. Thank you very much. And we'll try to make this panel a bit uh, interactive as well. Not now, but you will get a chance to ask questions. So please try to think of some nice, difficult questions for these panelists. So, uh, but Javier with, uh, is with us for first uh, hour only. Uh, so we'll, I'll start with an with a obvious question with, uh, for, for Javier first, and then we go to the, our own panelists. So Javier, you, you had a very nice, clear, and concise presentation of the framework. Uh, of course, the next obvious question is, uh, what's next? you know, uh, in the ANISA's horizon when it comes to um, education and skills development. Yes, uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, as I was telling at the end, the idea is to uh, continue this, uh, this process of collaboration with people. Uh, we have uh, last year and previous year established an ad hoc cooperation group with experts on the domain of cyber skills. Uh, now we are going to renew that that expert because we uh, of course for us it's very important to receive inputs of uh, experts community but uh, next year I would I would say this is going to be the the year of uh, testing the framework so testing is the the key word that means that we are going to uh, co-work even more uh, harder with the stakeholders in member states we need to actually identify specific uh, gaps when it comes to specific applications of the framework uh, in different contexts, sectorial, uh, territorial, uh, with a specific audiences. And uh, we need also to uh, identify specific strategies of collaboration with uh, different types of stakeholders, because of course it's not this, the same working with uh, educational institutions uh, than uh, working, for example, with um, uh, entrepreneurial associations. So we need to actually uh, entail a dialogue process with them, all with the interest of testing the framework. And hopefully, not next year, but the next one, we will be heading towards a, a massive implementation by establishing a specific dialogues with um, people in, in European institutions, uh, European Commission, agencies, and so on. Uh, bringing the experience actually of this testing process and uh, stay being ready for deploying the framework at the level. So that is basically in a nutshell what are our expectations. Thank you, Javier. Indeed, uh, ambitious goals, and we are really looking forward to, to this. Uh, before we go into some of the results that Concordia uh, has produced uh, around cybersecurity education, I think I have a more um, linking question with what uh, Javier explained and, and uh, with uh, Iru's uh, work on certification. So how do you see the relationship between these role profiles and ECSF and uh, the, the certification work that we have been doing? Uh, great. That's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> 
So I'll give you a little bit of background to, to connect a little bit where we are and where we started as a Concordia project and try actually to connect also these, uh, these different uh, words that you used. Uh, so let's go back a little bit in time. We had the, the beautiful question, uh, pictures that Gabby showed us. So three years ago when we started, and we started the test that had to do with um, education and training. Um, we had the problem, um, we had the ambition to create a, a way that we could assess the knowledge and skills of individuals. So we, th we said, what are we going to do to do that? And um, we decided we are going to create a certification scheme. So all of us know what a certification scheme is, right? Right? Right, okay. So a certification scheme is, is you prescribe a way that you are going to test the knowledge and the skills of a person. Okay. So we wanted to do that in the area of certification and certification skills. So in order to do that, to create the certification skill and fi uh, uh, find a way that you could test the skills and knowledge, we had to first know what the skills and knowledge of a person should be for a specific role. So that means that we had to have role profiles. So we identified like three years ago that there are a lot of role profiles but non, none of them were acknowledged and recognized within the European market. So we had a description of one role, for example, the CISO, which is very, a very well-known uh, role. We had it from a description from national authorities. We had it from international certification bodies. We had it from training organizations. We had it from multiple, multiple different areas, but we didn't have one shared. So our problem when we th were thinking about creating a certification scheme was actually which knowledge and which skills should we examine because we had these different inputs. So um, the problem that we had in creating the certification scheme actually came to become a problem with having a role profile and it came, it actually came back to the problem that we don't have, and we didn't at the time um, have a, share, a shared common language as the ECSF. So this actually brings it all together and connects it to the previous presentation. As I said, that one of the main goals of the ECSF is that it provides a common language and it allows everybody in the industry from their role to actually produce something that is valuable, common, recognizable within the European Union. So when we started as Concordia and we created the role profile, uh, we knew that we had a common base for the cybersecurity consultant. And when we created that, we knew that we could create a certification scheme and everybody would know what kind of knowledge and skills would be tested and evaluated through the certification and what each certificate represents. So this yeah. is <laughs> the connection. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Javier, you want to reflect on something or uh, all good for you? <laughs> all good, all good here. I prefer to listen to the other colleagues. Uh, so that, okay, uh, okay. Uh, very good. So we, we go to our more, uh, you know, technical experts. Um, so when, when you teach someone, usually, or, or when, when we learn, uh, for example, there are different ways. So you read a blog, uh, you know, it gives you maybe 5% learning that you remember after two days, or you learn from PowerPoints, uh, slides, that, that's also learning. But the third level is when you really go and do some hands-on, you know, uh, what we call training and exercises. And uh, that's what we have been doing and producing, um, you know, through the Kaipo Cyber Range and uh, Masaki University was leading this. So this, my obvious question to them is, how do you see uh, the, the tra traditional methods versus the new methods that, you know, new ways of skills development and education? Uh, please enlighten us with some, some of the work you have been doing. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Like, of course, like the traditional methods are great like as you said you can sit somewhere in a, in a meeting room or in a class but like yeah i mean it's a bit 
weird for me to say because I'm from university, but I don't believe like you can learn actually cybersecurity sitting somewhere in the class because like that's, that's not a good idea how to do that. Like yeah, we have uh, we have massive online courses and so on. That's great, I think. Uh, the, and but as you said, the most important part actually for especially for the cybersecurity, I believe it's it's hands-on. Like whatever whatever you're learning, you need to you need to test it, and then it's like it can be. Uh, it can be in cyber range, it can be something else, like if you want to practice some decision making process or so, you can run, I don't know, a tabletop exercise for the executives, for CISO and so on. You will just pass some question around the table, some papers, you will see how they, how they re react to a hypothetical scenario. I mean, actually, uh, it's always a good idea to, to base the hypothetical scenario on something real life like for example with our exercises we uh, are trying to to learn from real life so the the latest latest version of the exercise is based on what happened actually uh, during during spring early spring during the, the attack on ukraine like the whole advanced persistent threats and so so we want to present this let's say what we learned uh, in the exercise but yeah and there are also other things like these things we, we can do in, in cyber range itself. We can do also something, let's say, a bit easier just to uh, build, uh, build the skills to, to, to learn. We can do something like CTF games, CTF scenarios, like you basically don't need the whole cyber range there. You can have just, let's say, some Docker containers and so like something very easy and then you can also go, go a long way there. So yeah, I think that's, that's it. Uh, very good. Uh, when you do these kind of exercises, do you need to collaborate with different actors around, like uh, you know, university joining some company, uh, for example, CTFs or, or tabletop exercises for cyber? Uh, when we run the exercises, we actually, uh, in the past, we collaborated with uh, the the national uh, authority in Czech Republic, uh, which there, and those were actually exercises which were run for, uh, for government. So. We work with we worked with them. We try to if we do for some if we go for something more technical, we always try to uh, collaborate with industry. So if we want to do something, for example, for energy sector, we try to reach to I don't know Siemens or so on and talk about how it works actually in real life and so like it's extremely complex and like we're not able to to have the all knowledge by ourselves. So yeah, that make complete sense. I also heard that. Um uh, in Czech Republic, uh, you have uh, now the European Digital Innovation Hub on cybersecurity as well, I guess, where MUNI is or your university is part of. So that might provide a platform for next four or five years to continue what you have been doing in, uh, in Concordia in a practical setup and going to the actual target audience. So very good. Uh, now we go to a person who is uh, behind uh, Concordia cybersecurity uh, ecosystem and everything you, you hear about. So Felicia was leading this task for all these years uh, and we would like to hear from Felicia in a bit more detail, you know, uh, what have we done, uh, what have we done so far uh, with the cybersecurity ecosystem uh, building? Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, we we'll like to think that we did a lot. Um, <clears throat> I think it's safe to say that uh, cybersecurity is still a new kids on the block of sciences. Um, and um, there is a community out there, but we still need to work <clears throat> into building a larger one. And uh, we try to, to play our role in this, uh, in this picture. So uh, the task I was leading on education and building an education ecosystem um, for cybersecurity um, was addressed mainly to cybersecurity professionals. Uh, because we speak about skills, but the skills are staying with individuals, they are not staying with the companies or to the universities. Uh, so we address individuals directly, uh, the professionals on at this level, and uh, indirectly the companies and the, the, the course providers. <clears throat> So uh, what we planned at the beginning was to first uh, have a look on uh, um, what is the offer on the market for these uh, professionals and then um, 
try to identify some 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 needs uh, not covered on the market and uh, brought together some clever people like uh, Eero and uh, Jacob and other partners who are here in the room, not with us on the stage, unfortunately, because we have one more chair only. And um, yeah, well, we put together a program uh, to, to help uh, more professionals uh, build some skills and also test the skills. But before doing that, we thought that we, we need to define a model which is relevant to the industry. So basically, we, uh, after we, we, uh, we checked a bit uh, the market in terms of uh, existing courses and uh, the topics they are covering, uh, and uh, we assessed a bit the models they are, uh, <clears throat> they are following when delivering and building actually the content and delivering it, uh, we thought that it's uh, important to, to propose a methodology for developing courses for cybersecurity uh, professionals by bringing uh, industry from the beginning of the process. So based on this methodology, we then moved into uh, testing it and piloting it uh, by creating a, a course uh, for the cybersecurity consultant role profile we identified as interesting and important for the European market. And we attached to this course um, uh, certification exam uh, to, to test, as Eero was saying, it's important to test that the people attending a course uh, really acquired the, the, the knowledge uh, we try to, to cover in this course and uh, they develop the right skills. Uh, we, uh, we thought that the cybersecurity consultant should have. Um, this is uh, actually in a nutshell uh, what uh, we did under the, the, the task, but uh, if you want I can continue. The no, that does, we, we can come back to, okay. to you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for now. Um, as I said before, Javier is with us for first uh, hour only. Before I go and you know, ask something more to Javier, uh, maybe I should open the floor to you guys. If you have any question, anything jumping in your mind, no question is a bad question, that you want to ask uh, us, uh, I would be very happy. Usually this doesn't happen when you ask a question, no one says anything. You know? But uh, you know, you, this is your own team, so if you have anything, don't hesitate, just at any time. Uh, raise your hand uh, and we, we can be a bit more engaged. I think cybersecurity education is really a uh, need uh, of the day for e EU. Uh, we, especially in Sweden, we are investing a lot of money in cybersecurity, but there are no people to work on. You know, there is a cybersecurity center, okay, this many billions, but there are no people, so who will use those billions? So it's, it's extremely important that uh, the education match with the investment, so it's not just, you know, investing on some research and innovation activities, but also uh, the, the skill development or, or new education. So it's, a, it's an important problem, and it's a problem for everyone, I guess, in Europe and in more or less every country. Uh, Javier, I have um, one question that uh, when you were presenting profiles, it, it came in my mind. Uh, we were discussing um, different profiles. So one profile that we kind of miss um, uh, I hope I'll put it in an easy way, in a company is that you have technical people, you have policy people, but uh, if it's a cybersecurity company, uh, you need someone who can translate the research results into products that are understandable to market. So some sort of guy having an MBA, you know, uh, plus cybersecurity is usually needed uh, such that the results shouldn't end up in the valley of death, you know. So if I need this guy in my company, I build this nice cybersecurity, you know, I have 10 researchers, they have great ideas, I have some people who can implement this, uh, this but the last mile, how can I sell this to someone? I think a traditional MBA with blah blah would not work, I need a bit more cyber skills as well. Where do you put this role in out of these nine roles? This is an interesting question, actually. Uh, we, we, in a way, we address uh, perhaps some of the colleagues here uh, were attending also the, the conference we had in Athens. And uh, yeah, just coming back to that occasion, because we had an interesting discussion that uh, addressed similar questions. And uh, of course, when it comes to the cybersecurity sector, mm, there is that tendency 
And perhaps also in practice, there is a lot of technicalities and people, let's say, working on technical domains that require specific technical skills. But at the same time, um, provides could address some, some elements related to management, related to organizational aspects, even management of people uh, that are competent on, on specific technical skills. Uh, perhaps there is no specific profile in this common framework addressing that as a whole. Perhaps you, you have to pick up some, some components of, of uh, several profiles. But in my opinion, I think this kind of specificities um, Finding a profile with this kind of specificities in the labor market is not an easy task. So people, for example, um, uh, interested in combining different different competences from technical, managerial, organizational aspects, perhaps they can configure a strong, strong uh, profiles and curriculums that will be uh, definitely required in the in the cyber uh, security sector. And of course, uh, this also is related to the specificities of the sector you are working on. Because of course, it's not uh, the same cyber skills, uh, technical, managerial in the, uh, let's say, postal sector or water supply sector, you know? So th this kind of uh, elements apply also with some specific uh, technical knowledge on, on specific domains. And this is actually in relation to what we want to test uh, next year. Uh, so, by the way, the comment is, is actually to, uh, for those of you that uh, will continue working on this, uh, please uh, collaborate with us because we will, uh, and this is also a transversal comment uh, raised for the three colleagues in the panel that um, we need to collaborate in different collaboration frameworks. And, and for that, Anissa is also available and happy to, to start with those connections. Perfect. Thank you. Do you want to comment on this, or you want just, or, or? I have a question from uh, Okay, yes, please, Kaiser Bank. <laughs> Hi, it's Ramon from Kaiser Bank. Um, yeah, actually, just commenting to what you what you have said, and from the perspective of an industrial partner, um, I think that the, if we, uh, what I expect from 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 that framework is that you analyze the cybersecurity skills. Um, but if we are mixing that with other kind of skills from um, management skills and, and innovation skills, um, the, we will uh, lose the, the, the focus on, on the framework, I, from my opinion. Um, and I think that it should be focused on the cybersecurity skills. When you are recruiting, actually, um, and what you are recruiting for a specific position, for what you said, um, or, or my position, security innovation, I know that I have to have uh, skills from from innovation, uh, from uh, management, and also cybersecurity because I have to know the technical part. Um, but I, I don't expect that the framework um, uh, encompasses or, or or covers all that part. Also integrating the part of of uh, innovation, and I think that if we try to focus on all those specific specificities. We will lose the focus on 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 the what is needed in the framework that is analyzing um, the cybersecurity skills that should, that could be needed in in, in the industry. Uh, so that's my point. Okay, uh, valid point. Saying that a cybersecurity uh, innovator or cybersecurity sales officer is not needed as a separate skill set. No, but, but, uh, but yeah, uh, when we were trying to see who would you know convert our idea into sellable, saleable, you know, product, and they know market quite well, we didn't find anyone, uh, you know. So this is, I mean, this was kind of discussion early on as well that, you know, who will do the last mile uh, before we, you know, we are in technology readiness level eight, who will go nine, you know, and so on. So you said that you are a, you have a very similar role that I'm looking for you know, in, in Kaiser Bank. So that's what I, you know. I can, I can apply for you. At <laughs> no, but no, I, I, I'm good at, in Barcelona. Thank you. But, but um, yeah, but uh, as I, uh, what, what I mean is that um, the cybersecurity framework should uh, be an additional tool that the enterprise can use in order to analyze it, but not the 
the only tool uh, uh, for recruiting. I'm for sure right now you are analyzing um, uh, the, the, the people that are applying uh, for their skills and the part of sci-fi security, you will have the framework for analyzing it. But for sure, you will see um, additional uh, skills that will be needed for the positions will be that, 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 that. So that, that, that will be, I think, my approach, at least. Uh, I'm not the recruiter, but uh, that is what I would apply. OK, thank you. You hold my, you want to say something, you know? Or, no, you're just trying to hold the mic. No, OK. Uh, so. Uh, Again, uh, Javier, uh, we have 10 more minutes. So uh, maybe I have one more question for you, Javier, before you leave and, and we continue the panel here. Uh, you also have a role in ENISA as policy officer. So uh, in addition to your role as a CSF, uh, what policy-related activities are being carried out in ENISA? So I'd like to take this opportunity to you know, see a bit more from ENISA and their uh, policy development uh, work. Yes, yours. thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, actually, uh, a big part of my activities at ENISA are related to the monitoring and observation function, function of cybersecurity policies at EU level. Um, this is because of the Cybersecurity Cyber Security Act, which is the piece of legislation giving the mandate, the permanent mandate to ENISA establishing its Article 5, the task related to this policy development aspect. So we normally uh, co-work with the colleagues of DG Connect in the Commission, uh, helping actually to contribute to EU policy development processes um, in development and implementation phase. So uh, development, for example, in, in aspects related to emerging emerging policy files or pieces of legislation. Now, recently, you must have heard about uh, the Cyber Resilience Act. So, for example, we've been contributing with um, impact assessment aspects or consultations, elements that, in a way, uh, give uh, more light on the requirements and the needs for, for, for legislation on those domains. So we also contribute, for example, in uh, DORA, which is uh, Related to financial financial aspects and cybersecurity, and uh, as part of that activity, we are setting now the so-called cybersecurity policy observatory. Uh, within this uh, CSPO, actually, the idea is to uh, promote a better observation aspect of, of policies at EU level, but also in collaboration with member states uh, uh, stakeholders. So. Uh, now I can, in a way, pre-confirm that uh, there is still a lot of work to do, but we are going to have a conference on the 26th of January in Brussels. It will be the first conference of the Cybersecurity Policy Observatory. And uh, we expect to have these uh, related discussions on yeah, ways to improve policies from collaboration, uh, how to uh, better monitor and inform EU, EU uh, policy making process. And finally, in a connection also, because everything, of course, uh, should be related, or we should uh, look for synergies. Uh, we have also an um, activity related to sectorial, sectorial aspects uh, in line with the NIS strategy. Uh, so, for example, one of the strategic sectors is the maritime sector. And I also connect uh, the, the comment of the colleague uh, previously that, of course, the, the framework shouldn't be uh, addressing elements that are not related to cybersecurity. I agree with that. Uh, because for, 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 for a case, there are, there are several frameworks at the level. But still, when it comes to those synergies, for example, coming back to maritime maritime sector, uh, colleagues in Digimar in the Commission, they are they are, uh, for example, promoting the so-called uh, Blue Economy Skills uh, Initiative, um, and of course, in that in that specific framework, when it comes to cyber cybersecurity, perhaps there should be complementarities. So you can see that at the beginning, I was presenting the framework in a very general context, but then there are some specific uh, applications of it at, at several levels. And, and, and I think it's worth to think about these specific synergies, of course, without losing sight of uh, the core activity here, which is cybersecurity. So that's it, a little bit. Uh, 
the other things I'm doing. And I take advantage to thank you all for 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 your time. Unfortunately, as you say, I have to to go uh, for another meeting and I'm here available Anissa, my colleagues and, and myself for working in, in cyber skills uh, framework. Uh, so hopefully we can have uh, additional collaboration in the months, years to come. Thank you very much, Javier, and thank you for valuable insights. And you know, the, I learned a lot, honestly, uh, around these things in a more uh, you know concise and short way. Uh, with this, I, I would like to thank you and ask our audience to thank you with uh, you know being us today. And, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, we continue our panel with our own Con Concordian panelist and uh, dig a bit. Oh, so there, there's a question for maybe Javier, you have three more minutes with us, but uh, yes. Yes, thank you. So I would like to continue the, the, what uh, Ramon just said. My name is Alyosha Pasic from Atos. So we are from industry. We, we cannot really wait for uh, a certification and uh, these things. We are launching, for example, now in November, we are launching a program called uh, Cybersecurity Kid Dive which is, uh, you can see on the web page, which is a kind of program with 100 uh, days for graduates to learn about cybersecurity for three different careers in SOC, operator, forensic, uh, and also consultant. Uh, what I'm trying to say that uh, in industry, the skills shortage is so big that we are launching our own uh, programs and, and our own uh, frameworks. We are not waiting for ENISA or, or uh, but in the future, the value, we can see value that if it, this is comparable, if there is a benchmarking, if there is a certification, and we can compare because there are a lot of students coming from schools or universities which are unknown and they are, we never heard of them. And we don't know if these certificates that they bring have any value. There are, of course, universities which are well recognized and the students which come with, uh, with uh, reputation and etc. But this is it's really a mess, and this is also why industry is launching these programs like Security Dive. Again, I, I invite you to look at these three uh, roles and a program that is in 100 days, it's making specialist professionals, I hope so at least, <laughs> that we need. It will be more than 100 students in, in Paris following this program. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, RICE is also a certification body, and it's not either and or, it's both. You know, it's not we are saying that industry shouldn't do anything and wait for the certification and then do something. Of course, we are uh, teaching on all levels and you are uh, more focused on lifelong learning. And when it, there's lifelong learning, students want some sort of recognition that typically universities don't give. You know, they don't give degrees when you do a formal education. Uh, but I agree. I mean, the, the, there are lots of uh, industrial programs who are also working on cybersecurity and will continue. Thank you uh, for this. And thank you, Javier, again, uh, for being with us, if you are still uh, on this screen, but not on this screen. So I think he's gone, but he's stuck on that screen. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, we jump a bit, not too deep, but some deep, on the results from Concordia over these three and a half years. Uh, and I will start with Aero uh, and ask, uh, what is the added value? that Concordia brings in when it comes to cybersecurity skills and certification? It's so many. Yeah, I don't know go where ahead. to start. <laughs> uh, so we have time, right? Hours oh, yeah. and hours. Uh, but first of all, uh, more like this? OK. Um, first of all, um, I want to start a little bit with the problem and continue with what um, my colleagues already said. Um, so. First of all, I want to ask from the audience, can I have, just can you raise your hand if you have a cybersecurity professional certification? Anyone that has a certification, just raise your hands. Don't be shy, I know you have them. <laughs> so, let's roughly saying, like, let's say that we are, I don't know, 50 people in the room, about half of you uh, raise your hands. Now I have a, a difficult question. So how many people from you that raise your hands actually did a practical test to prove, <laughs> thank you Nicholas, <laughs> to prove this, um, this, that you have this knowledge and skills, a practical test within your certification exam? 
Great, thank you very much. I was expecting that. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we keep talking about roles having, role profiles having skills and knowledge. So knowledge is the things that you know, that you have learned, and skills is actually having the ability to take the knowledge that you have learned and practice them. So when it comes to practical testing, it means that I create some kind of an environment, and it can be any environment, where you can practically test that you have the ability to um, exercise your knowledge. So it's not just about knowing the definition of an incident and what an incident response team should do, but actually being able to do that when you identify that you have an incident. It's not just about uh, knowing that firewall rules exist, but actually implementing them practically. Or uh, doing um, um, using tools like Nmap or any other, I'm not doing any uh, advertising here, <laughs> sorry for the names, but taking the, the tools and actually doing this in practice. So hopefully I have, uh, I have explained a little bit what practical testing means, but now let me see a raise of hands for all of you that have a certification that you actually participated in a practical test within the certification. Yes. Go ahead. University, we, at our university, we do a master in cybersecurity, but the teachers themselves don't have a certification of cybersecurity because that didn't exist at the time. So, right. do we qualify or should we somewhere try to get a certificate? And where? The thing is that, and I, I like that question also, it's a little bit tricky, but I like it because. It allows me to say that certification and training are not linked in the way that we think. Just because you don't um, follow a specification training or a, a, specification, a specific course doesn't mean you don't have the knowledge and skills. What certification actually does is that it assesses that you actually have them to a degree that these predefined within a certification scheme. So it doesn't matter if when I took the course there was no relevant certification or there was no cybersecurity academic degree. What it matters is that somehow I, I learned, I, I read, I experimented a lot and I have these skills and knowledge and I can test them through a certification scheme. Does this help? Question. More questions. Very interesting panel. Uh, yes. Yeah, you're, you're talking about certification, right? Uh, and what I hear is sort of like uh, constructive alignment. What you learn on the learning environment that you should be able to be tested on. But you're talking about certification, but what about university courses? Because uh, in my opinion, I teach a course where what you're asking for is what do I test in the students in? They get the environment that they've been playing with an ex in, in the whole semester, and they get get tested uh, in the exam. Uh, that's you know, that's, yeah, practical tests. So when we talk about certification, usually we connect it to professional training, usually. So we are beyond the academic sphere. But the principle is the same. It's actually the same for anything. We have, and actually what um, Javier actually showed you at some point, it showed you the EQF, which is the framework that connects learning objectives to assessment. So it doesn't matter if we call it certification or we just call it assessment within, um, uh, within an academic degree. What matters is that we have A in one hand, which is what we should have, and B in the other hand is what a person shows that they have, and they should be equal and aligned. So I totally agree. Uh, it's just that we use certification in the professional area here and in professional education, but the concept is the same. But even if the concept, uh, even if we talk in professional education or academic degrees, we still have the problem that we were missing 
you know, the what should a professional have in knowledge and skills in order to perform a task effectively? Because this is what the role profile is all about. What they should have, what they should know to do this role effectively. And if they have this knowledge and skills through an academic degree, then that is fine with me. That is perfectly fine. Yes, um, Ivana. Thank you. Uh, I totally agree with you. But the thing is, once we define what, uh, what skills that they should learn, then the most important thing, again, is what you were pointing out, which is the assessment part. What, that's what you were asking about those that have taken certificate. If they've been assessed in a practical manner because if the learning outcome says that they should have these skills and they should be able to do this, like configure firewalls or uh, do an intrusion detection or do, do an end map, then they should be able to perform that. Yes. Yeah. Correct. And that is, actually, that is actually the point in finding out assessment methodologies that would allow us to test. And this, is the, this is, was the, the aim of my question. So, um, although we, we uh, skipped a little bit <laughs> forward from the question, what I was trying to get at is that a lot of us may have a professional um, uh, certificate or a lot of us may have um, an academic degree, but maybe and judging from me that I graduated a long time ago, we don't have, um, we never participated in actually proving to ourselves, first of all, and to others, that we actually possess this, this knowledge and skills. And this is one of the contributions of Concordia to get to the, <laughs> to the answer. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so what we really did is that we took this point and we tried to analyze it and split it up in, in, in little bits and little parts. And we saw that we should definitely define what assessment means on cybersecurity skills. And we should definitely define that it's not enough to test theoretical knowledge. Like, okay, it's okay that you know the definition and it's a prerequisite that you know the definition. But it's already really important that we connect it to being able to actually practice it, to make it useful also for your future um, steps and the organization that's going to hire you. So what we did is that we defined a framework, so a skill certification framework, where it says that for cybersecurity skills, you should definitely test theoretical knowledge and test and evaluate and assess practical skills. And it's really great that we collaborated with the team and Jakob here and Kaipo and we were able to pilot it and get all these recommendations and put them in this framework. And hopefully we can pass it over as Concordia finishes to other projects so that they don't start from scratch and they know that every time they create a certification scheme for skills, for cybersecurity skills, they need to follow these guidelines and have theoretical and practical assessment within the context. Thank you. Thank you very much, you know, uh, indeed a uh, good discussion and I think no one denies that, I mean, the old school education, whether it's on the university level or in the professional uh, certification, without some sort of hands-on, it's just, uh, you know, some text you remember for a couple of days or weeks and they'll disappear. But uh, I must say that a five, six months professional uh, certification is no way near a two years university professional degree where you, you know, analytically develop a lot. Uh, but of course, universities should, if they are, their cybersecurity course is just, you know, CIA and all the text and professional education gives you uh, very practical work, uh, then there is something wrong with our educational system in universities, especially when it comes to cybersecurity. But I, I know, at least in Sweden, Norway, Scandinavia, there we are a bit more involved. Uh, there are fancy tools being deployed in universities for practical course. I mean, there are information security culture course as well, and that's on a different level. But if it's a practical course, there are practical exercises. And speaking of practical exercises, you know, cyber security or cyber soldiers is more like, uh, you know, military soldiers. Uh, in a way that when you train someone uh, in the military, you have something called shooting range. You know, where you go, 
well, give a you know a gun in the hand. It's a battlefield. It's some sort of you know knowledge and skills you develop before, and you have an armor, and you go and train yourself. In the same way, when you try to train someone in the cyber world, we call, we we have a concept or platform called cyber ranges, and Concordia during all these years have been well, uh, building this, and we have the very first open source cyber range. Uh, which, uh, thanks to Kaipo, it was developed. So, indeed, my next question and this discussion will go to Kaipo and say, what does this cyber range really bring in? Or maybe a couple of sentences on what is a cyber range, you know, so for, for the people who are uh, not uh, in the area know a bit more, and how can we leverage on cyber uh, ranges for skills development? Yeah, uh, I mean, let's start with one thing, actually, uh, as, as cyber ranges are pretty much pretty awesome for training, especially, uh, you know, the, the hands-on part, but just please let's, let's not see them as a, as a silver bullet solution because, like, there are some parts that you cannot actually do there and, like, you know, if you have only, if you, if you have only hammer and then everything looks like a nail, so let's not do this. But the cyber range, from my point of view, it's great for uh, really creating huge environments, uh, you know, uh, tens and tens of computers, you can put networks together, segmentation and so on. You can create like a semi-realistic environment, you can mirror something from any organization, company. I'm saying semi-realistic because we learned actually that making a realistic 100% copy of the environment is kind of not financially feasible especially, and also the people kind of don't care uh, if the environment is super realistic or just like 80% realistic when you launch the, the full-scale attack on them. So, like, that's, you can definitely build a very realistic environment that's, that's great for the trainees. And what is great for you as, a, as a, someone who is providing the training, uh, you can, uh, especially with the new cyber ranges and so on, uh, everything is somehow uh, scripted. So it, it can be built in the same way again and again. The repeatability and this all is cutting costs really, really, really greatly. So, like you don't have to, you don't have to prepare your lab every 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 week. You just like hit a button and it spins up from from the cloud or so on. So that's that's the perfect thing. Also, you can because, like, usually you have cyber ranges as a, as a virtual environment. Then you can actually play with real tools that, because they don't let you, for some reason, to to play with real tools and launch real attacks in live infrastructures. I, like, I don't know why, but yeah, they don't want to let you do that. So you can do anything there. If you break it, you can just build it. You can build it again. Uh, what is good also, or what is great? Uh, from the cyber range perspective, or what we shouldn't be afraid to to, to put there, is let's not do the the training or ex or especially the exercises just about the let's say hardcore technical stuff. Just not let's not do just the hardening and so on. Like we can also include like or what we do a lot is you put a communication because you have team of defenders so you force them to communicate. You try to force them to collaborate under pressure and so on. And I think the last thing, but this is more specific for Kaipo Cyber Range and so on, because we decided to, to make everything open. We want to have also all the content as open as possible. So basically any institution, university can download the, the scenario or the building block, you can exchange it and so on. That like we basically use the same tools you use for setting up the real infrastructure. We're using the, it for the creating the, let's say, the virtual infrastructure. So. That's also, I think, very strong point. Thank you. I mean, uh, yes, Kai, uh, Aiko. Uh, oh, oh so, okay. The mic is closer, Aiko, so we just uh, go there first. Uh, I would like to thank the group uh, that are actually developing Kaipo. I've uh, looked at it. You're doing a great job uh, giving us uh, platforms to uh, train our students. Um, I think I've got in touch with you once. The only um, thing that I hope, because uh, it's, there is a, a bit of a scalability issue since you're using OpenStack as a, on the virtualization platform and uh, running virtual machines and so on. 
uh, which means that if you have a lot, if you have a large class, then uh, you need, like you were saying, the resources that you need. Could you be thinking about uh, implementing, like in containers, just like LXD, not necessarily Docker, but LXD containers and so on? Uh, yeah, well, actually, that's that what I said. It is not always the, the right tool. I think the, the let's say, complementary tool was actually developed in another European project in the CyberSec for Europe. There, like, our colleagues worked on, uh, let's say, very lightweight solution, which is using uh, basically this you know, student's laptop. They, they play with uh, virtual box and so on then I think this may be a bit easier. We, we are thinking about, about Docker and so on, but the, like we want to actually keep it this way. I mean, we know it's kind of heavy, but we are providing some, some functionalities which are not available in like, I don't know, uh, the CT, CTFD or so. So that's like, that's sadly the price. But you can check the, you can check the tool from the other project. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Aiko. Uh, assume that I'm a teacher at a university and I have to give my first lecture on cybersecurity and I don't like PowerPoint slides, I want to have something practical for the students. So I see Kaipo, I think, yes, that's it. How much time would it take me to set something up that is somehow useful and say the group of students is 100 students, how much time and how much money would I need to invest? Uh, okay. Uh, maybe, maybe clarify the question. You does not mean ICO, but a security, no. you know, hands-on guy, uh, the new motivation, engineer. The motivation is that I heard this question from other people, yeah. not me, uh, and they are exactly struggling with this question. Should I invest my time in something like Kaipo, or does it take too much time and it's not feasible? Hmm? Uh, I I believe it doesn't take so much time now because like we worked on the deployment a lot. Uh, from my experience and from experience uh, of my colleagues, because they have, have to deal with let's say uh, questions and like we're trying to even because we're open source and so we're trying to support the people using it. Actually, the biggest issue often is is the open stack itself. The the Kaipo part it's kind of easy. Uh, there are two so there, there, there are like there are several solutions to the, to this. Uh, one is that you can use, let's say, public public cloud, public open OpenStack cloud, which we tested with. I think one or two providers. It, it should work. Uh, of course, if you if you if you believe in yourself and so you can spin a, spin up your own OpenStack cloud. As I said, it should be significantly easier than it was in the past, and. Again, uh, and the other thing is we can, let's say, fix it up for you. That's more we, let's say, because we're trying to support Kaipo as, as such, we have, let's say, more commercialized services where we can set up everything and we did it for some partners. But I think from university point of view, it's more about your setting up everything by yourself. So if you have like some hardware and so on, I think it should take like, few days like my, my colleagues are able to spin it up in like I don't know hour or two but like that's not the case so yeah that's it okay maybe a clarification question also for me I didn't go is it possible to run the Kaipo in the cloud fully remotely or you have to install components locally in your premises mm, you can you can run it fully fully remotely like you can use a public provider public mm. cloud provider and then like you are accessing everything through GUI, through you know, through your web browser and so on. So you can just try to to get some credits in some OpenStack, public OpenStack cloud, and then you can spin it up there. Okay. Are you planning to run like Kaipo Cyber Range as a service in the cloud, and we uh, the, um, the user side only take care of, you know, um, material? We, like we can provide, let's say, very very lim limited service. Because like we don't, I don't think we don't have enough cloud resources to like, you know, play it big. But every time when someone is interested, we can like set up the test instance, let and maybe try to do them like a training or two, and then they will see. But we cannot actually right now support, let's say, 
uh, Kaipo as a service as such. Mm. Okay, but, but uh, good ambition. I think, I mean, Rice has a really good experience with starting from your question, should we go for cyber ranges or not? So we, uh, I travel at least uh, 10 countries looking at 20 cyber ranges platform and, you know, look, uh, and then see, because it really depends what's your uh, purpose. Uh, for example, RISE, which is a company, we have more professional purpose to train all people who work in industry in Sweden on cybersecurity, you know, have some sort of cybersecurity role. So we ended up sticking to one specific platform uh, for, for, for some reasons. But some of the use cases when we were procuring cyber range, we never uh, thought, you know. For example, we have different courses. So the most, um, uh, the course that we sold the most or the more, most interesting course is for the board members and CEOs of the company that we actually teach inside cyber range. They are not getting all this hands-on technical stuff, but they have some high level hands-on combined with decision making, you know, and this is, they are so happy and that's, the most expensive course right now, and it just works. And having a platform, though in the beginning has lots of investment money-wise and people resources-wise, but then once you have it, it's actually you can create any perceivable IT setup in the virtual world, you know, and do it for cybersecurity. We are now building something called AI range. So using the same cyber range concept, but actually testing it for AI algorithms for adversarial attacks and some other things. So, so it's a, I think future lies in cyber ranges, especially when it comes to uh, cybersecurity education. Uh, but if you have a use case where, you know, if you, you teach a specific skill to a student, maybe a single machine virtual box would be enough. But if you really have a use case where you have network and you need to connect things together and see the phenomena or results in more you know, network scenario where you have all sorts of attacks possible, cyber ranges is the way to go. Uh, and we have really good experience with the, with the cyber ranges. Yes. Uh, and just maybe one comment actually on this, because we are still talking about cyber ranges as like as a technology, but uh, from uh, the, the, the thing we haven't said that the cyber range itself is really just a technology and what we need here to, to help the, the skills development, we need the content for it. So it's like, otherwise we have like fancy tool, but I think that other European projects which are following up, like Revire, for example, they are building also on top of the skills framework and they're using the cyber range so they will deliver content like the training uh, for, the, for, the, for the roles we heard and that should be hands-on, should be practical, should be also available, I guess, publicly, so. Okay. Very good. We have six more minutes, and my last question is for um, Felicia. Uh, and uh, of course, it's about cybersecurity education, and we, we have different um, outcomes and results uh, out of our work uh, within the cybersecurity education. What are your favorites? You know that you want to highlight at the end of the panel, uh, and what's next, maybe? What's next? Uh... We, I would say that we should continue collaborating, maybe outside the Concordia project, but uh, we should build on the results we managed to, to, to accomplish together. And I was really pleased to hear that, uh, for instance, in the courses you are running for your management, they are very excited because actually when we started building the course for the cybersecurity consultant profile, we, we thought that uh, we should not only teach uh, threats and uh, <clears throat> technology-related stuff, but also we should touch on economics of cybersecurity, and this is an important component of our course. And um, people are getting very, very attracted to, the, to this uh, topic. And uh, we see an increase in interest and the number of applications to the course. So it's a sign that we did a good job. So two years ago, when we launched the pilot on the course, we started with 20 people, 22. And uh, now we are um, in the process of running the, the theoretical part of the course and uh, we got more than 200 people registered. Not all of them are finishing though because it's not an easy course. And uh, we are trying to filter a bit uh, um, the participants here because the funnel we have is to, to bring them through the course, uh, the online uh, course uh, covering some technical knowledge to the hands-on uh, webinar, 
uh, where we uh, uh, put them to work uh, on Kaipo platform, and then we uh, we really invite them to to apply for the certification uh, exam, the C3 by Concordia certification. Uh, and um, it looks like they are very eager to take this exam. I'm on a daily basis uh, answering to a lot of questions linked to this uh, certification. They are all into taking this certificate, which is a good sign that we are having a, are building a name on the certification market there, and they want to have it. And um, so the course is important, the certification is important. And uh, maybe a comment uh, uh, I want to make on the course, because I really enjoyed working on this uh, process, and I really like to see that uh, we made an impact already on the market, is that uh, two days ago uh, I saw a post on LinkedIn, so one of the participants to the course uh, managed to finish the first part, uh, the online model, and got a, a certificate uh, from uh, Coursera because we are hosting all these online models on Coursera. And he posted it on LinkedIn. And uh, the first comment he got was from a company saying, um, I have a job for you. And I was like, wow. So uh, it looks like uh, what we are doing, um, it's making a, a bit of an impact on the market. And it really made my day that uh, they small comment. So uh, this is a thing we want to, uh, to continue doing it outside the project. And uh, we have a lot of our other projects to do. But uh, yeah, just to point a few, these yeah. two. Excellent. I'm also very happy to see that, uh, that you know, people are more uh, you know, engaged with our results. And, uh, other people are engaged and interested in them, so uh, hiring them. So we have a couple of minutes left. If you have anything jumping in your mind that you want to ask before we finish or end this panel, please raise your hands. And uh, if, if not, maybe I give 30 seconds to all these panelists if you want to see any. Say anything if you know, don't take all the two minutes. Uh, True. Please True. go ahead. <laughs> it's an illness. I'm trying to, uh, to treat it, not to speak so much. Um, um, so I wanted to continue from where Felicia left off, saying that the fact that we have more than 200 people asking about the cybersecurity consultant is, is, a, is actually pretty, pretty nice. <laughs> um, uh, but it actually shows that there is a market need and uh, it justifies the way that we started working on this when we did the feasibility analysis to see what does the market need and create a certification scheme and a course for that. Not just say that I, I find it nice, but actually ask the market what they need. And also to take it one step further, it shows also that the ECSF, the European Cybersecurity Skills Framework, is not complete, uh, meaning that there are still roles that uh, are needed, uh, role profiles that are needed within the European market and the world market. The cybersecurity consultant is one of them. And I'm really, really eager to see the work of ENISA and other projects like Require and professionals continue on that path. So it's not that the, we have the ECSF now, but it's not final and we should not treat it as final. There are 12 profiles in there, but there should be more. And we should think definitely on the things that were discussed also from Aliosa, uh, that uh, what about transversal skills? How should we connect them to cybersecurity roles? especially for the cases where there is a, is a connection between them and they are important, these skills are important to the, the role being uh, implemented effectively. So I'm really anxious to see the work being continued. That's it. Thank you very much, Iro. If you two don't want to add anything, that's way to ask not to add anything. So uh, I think uh, I am really proud that we really ended this panel on time. Exact, and I really take this opportunity to thank my, my panelists as well for this. Please give them a big applause. Thank you. Thank you.